Alrighty, in this last section, I'm going to talk about some of the design considerations you have to keep in mind when you're planning to print the things that you're designing in 3D. Now, obviously, one of the things you can't create is an overhang, which is basically something that dips down. So as the print is printing up, if there's things that dip down, it can't print them because it's got to print successive layers going up that are supported. You can, of course, add support layers, but generally I just like to pr design things that you can just print straight. And so part of it is figuring out geometrically how you can lay out an item that might have overhangs and things in such a way that you can print it in one go. Uh, so that's the first um, thing that you've probably got to keep in mind. You can have overhangs that, are, that come up at a 45 degree angle. So if you see that, that one's rising at a 45 degree angle and that will print just fine. Um, curved surfaces are a bit of a challenge because they tend to uh, not print very nicely. So on this one, what I did was I went 45 degrees and then curved from there up and, and that ends up uh, giving you the kind of curvy look that you like. but. Um, from a practical printing standpoint, it prints perfectly because it's starting with a 45 degree angle, which then meets a, an arc um, tangentially. Um, so that's how I did those ones. Problems that you're going to run into. Um, on a part like this, where I had this thin area here, this, all of this part of the part stuck quite well, but this little bit tended to lift. So you can add a thing called an ear tab, which is just basically a one layer thick uh, circle. Like it's, uh, it's like a cylinder that's very, very, uh, not very tall. So it's only 0.1 or 1.5 of a mil tall, or depending on what you're printing. I actually normally do them 0.3 um, for uh, 0.2 mil prints and 0.15 uh, for uh, 1 mil prints. And basically what that does is it increases the surface area that's anchoring that bit down that's tending to lift and it'll keep it down on the plate and stop it from, from lifting off. So for things that you're having a bit of, a, a bit of trouble with, uh, adding an ear tab is a great way to go. And um, if they're one layer high, high, you can generally just tear them off um, or just use a pair of scissors to cut them off. Um, if you're going to create um, axles that you want things to turn on that are mechanical, a bit like the um, PLA cube gears that I've got here, then it's even though you think you can print them vertically, it, it never works as well and it's never as strong as printing them horizontally. So you want to print um, axles and uh, pins, um, things like that, on the XY plane. So here's an example of one that I did for one of my bikes. Uh, my bike models um, and generally what I do with something that's round is I'll just um, make one side of it flat and uh, um, so you end up with just like one flat edge that um, that can stick to the surface and then I'll print it up from there and that works perfectly well like these things turn nicely um, and they're, they're very strong whereas if you tried to print it this way um, I just find that the strength isn't there. The layers tend to snap apart, whereas this thing is really, really strong. Um, even though uh, this was only printed at 20%, the outer shells on it just make it really strong. So if you are doing mechanical parts that you want to be able to move um, freely, um, invest in a pair of reamers and just hand ream out the holes once you're done. Um, the pins will tend to print pretty close, particularly if you do them horizontally, just a bit of a sand and in my experience, they'll just all just slot straight in without any trouble if you ream out the holes. The holes tend to be the biggest problem, not the, not the axles. If you do the axles on an X or a Y plane um, and just print them up and give them a light sand, um, they'll tend to be dimensionally very close and it's really the holes that you'll have to ream out. And mostly that's because if you've got a hole that's lying down flat like this, as it gets to the top edge, it's got, to, it's got to basically sort of start building or bridging that gap. And the layers on the edge will just tend to, um, they're hanging out as an overhang, and then they're building on top of that. So you end up with probably a perfect round edge on the bottom, 
but then just on the top it starts to have overhangs and it starts to have imperfections. So if you just ream that hole out um, so that it's perfectly circular, all your mechanical parts will move quite nicely. Now, if you're planning to do some large models, models that are larger than you can actually fit um, into the, onto the build platform, which is one of the things I've been doing with my, with my bike models. Um, what you'll tend to do is slice them or you know, cut them into sections and glue them together. Uh, epoxy resin, two part epoxy resin works very well with the PLA. Now, if you want them to mate accurately, the sections that you want to mate together, you should print them along the same axis. So for instance, uh, um, I had one part which uh, I was doing across here which met another part, which I actually ended up printing vertically. And, uh, and I made sure that, that both of them were on the same um, y-axis. Um, so that that way, if there's any small uh, variation in x, y dimensions, um, at least you're printing in the same direction and they should mate up pretty well. Um, so that's something to try. And, and finally, if you've got any overhangs, so this one was printed uh, like this. Um, uh, the overhangs need to be 45 degrees at most. Um, any, anything much more and you'll start getting sort of nasty rough edges on the bottom as it's building up. Um, so generally I would say 45 degrees is, is you'll get a really nice surface finish which this one's got with 45 degrees but as you start sort of angling lower um, you'll have more problems getting a good result. So in this final section, I'm going to talk a bit about some example designs that I've done. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about is the uh, uh, design I did for the PLA version of the pins for Emmett's um, gear cubes and uh, gear heart. And the problem was is that, um, I mean, Emmett did a brilliant job of this and he did it in SD CAD. But when it came to the pins, they were designed to work with ABS and the way they were designed, they were designed to sort of graze a bit um, of the plastic as they were pushed in. Um, but because PLA is so brittle, all that happened was they snapped. So in order to correct this, there were two things that I needed to do. First of was to realize that when you've got an end that's going to pinch inside a circle, you've got to make sure that it's actually a circle when it's pinched. So you've got to start with an outer edge that looks like an oval um, that'll squash rather than a what he'd used was a revolved thing that was just sliced on either side flat and, uh, and so the edges of it were too high. Um, and the next bit um, was to sort of round those edges so that they inserted nicely and they didn't have sort of hard, air, hard bits that could catch or be forced. And finally, um, to make it flexible, um, I sort of took some inspiration from the way I've seen uh, bones, uh, like if you do a cross section of a bone, they're hollow, and they tend to have thinner walls as they protrude out that go into thicker walls as they go into the stem. And so I did basically the same thing with the pin. I used a parabola that was revolved inside there to cut out uh, the edge so that as it gets closer to the to the edge inside of the pin it's thicker and as it gets right out to the edge it's it's very thin on the wall um, and that seems to have provided just enough flex so that the pins as I as I showed you before they they can pull in and out they snap into place quite nicely with a good snap and they they turn freely so that worked really well the next thing I'm going to show you is the uh, um, design for the um, extruder upgrade. Now this is obviously a much more technical design where you're really concerned about aligning all of the different features um, correctly. So when I set out to do a design like this, the first thing I, I do is measure all of the features that I have to get right. And what I do is I spatially figure out how to connect one feature to the next so that I know what the dimensions are to get from one place to the next. So you basically got a series of lines that are just connecting things spatially and what those features are. 
So that's the first thing you have to worry about. And I use the uh, digital uh, calipers to measure all of that. And then the second thing is to look at the clearances. So what you want to know is, is I've got all of these features like holes and things that I've got to screw together. How are they, how, how do they relate to each other? And then in terms of the package, what, what, what shape does it have to fit into? And so with the um, extruder upgrade, you had a, a flange inside it that, that it had to slot over the top of, the base plate did. Um, you had uh, the heating block um, or the cooling block underneath that it had to rest against. You had the, uh, just the physical shape because you've got the fan on the left hand side. So it had to fit within that constraint. Um, but one of the ones that I actually missed was there was room out on the side to add this tab because there was actually space on the far end of the gantry for it to go. You couldn't have it down the bottom because that's where the contact switch is. Um, but up the top there was, there was just enough room to have a little bit of a protrusion for the thumb tab. And it was actually another uh, guy on Thingiverse, uh, Tony, who spotted that and made a, 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 a derivative um, design, which I then I guess re-derived and, uh, and came up with, a, with one that, that worked with the original geometry that I'd done. Um, so the final thing I'm going to show you is um, this is the uh, design of the original um, clip-on holder for the dial indicator that I did. And when I made the um, extruder upgrade, the tab, of course, needed to have somewhere to go. So I needed to put a hole in it. And um, when you're doing a change to a design, sometimes what's quite a good idea is to put that into the space where it's got to go and actually draw on it um, where the, what changes you need to make to it. So I just used a marker pen and drew on it drew some measurements and things of bits that I wanted to change. And a little bit like I said before, what you're trying to do here is understand the relationship or the spatial relationship between the, chain, between the current part and the future part that you're trying to define and the spatial relationships between the changes. So you're looking at particular points that you can measure from in your existing geometry to add new alterations from. And what I tend to do is actually draw those on the part so that I can just take it over to the, so, you know, where I'm working on the software and, um, and make those changes to the original model. And even still, you can stuff up. So uh, what I wanted to do with this um, upgrade originally was to um, have the dial indicator face facing the front so that it was easier to read. Uh, but I actually ended up putting it too far out and so I printed this first version of it only to discover that the dial indicator went straight down over the top of the rail, uh, which wasn't any good. So I had to just move it all back a bit and uh, yeah, that was a real gotcha. I just didn't notice that I'd, that I'd done that in the, in the in the diagramming that I did on this, uh, somehow I said, yes, move it 20 that way. And really there was only room to move it 10. But, um, so it's on a sm slight angle now, but it's only, it's only really tiny. And uh, all in all, um, I'm really happy with the way that that part's resolved. And the um, extruder upgrade's got a little window and it just inserts straight through it. All right, guys. Well, um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thanks for your time and attention. Um, I hope you found uh, all of that uh, rather constructive and useful. And, um, you know, please join us on the MakerBot Googles group. Uh, it's really been, it's a fabulous uh, community. Um, all the guys there have been incredibly helpful. Uh, I know guys look at me and say, you know, why do you put in so much time helping other people out uh, on the MakerBot community? But the times that I've run into problems where I've been able to ask people for help and get answers, you know, within like, like if not that day, the next day, they'll get answered those questions um, by lots of people. 
um, that has just saved me so much time and helped me so so much um, so really I, I really encourage everybody to get online participate in these groups uh, you know whether it's for other things like uh, the firmware or whatever um, but if you've got a replicator too, um, get on the MakerBot operators group on Google Groups and uh, you know, enjoy the banter and the humor and, and participate in uh, you know, getting some help and, uh, and helping others. Uh, it's really rewarding. Cheers, guys. Bye.